Welcome everyone. I hope you're enjoying MY's session so far. My name is Rancho. I manage customer engineering team at Google Public Sector. In today's session, we'll be talking about email defenses and how we are managing across state-sponsored adversaries and ransomware attacks. The numbers here are probably not surprising to you. The threat landscape has evolved over the years and we've seen a rise in state-sponsored adversaries, commercially motivated ransomware attacks. These ransomware attacks have organically been rising and it's rising as much as the potential payouts are also increasing. With generative AI and other new technologies, you can see that these attacks are also mutating and growing at a rapid scale, challenging our content classification models. So how do these attacks happen? Typically, attacks happen as a phishing attack. Agreed, not every attack is successful, but those that are, they start with a phishing attack and leads towards uh, bringing stolen phishing credentials and user credentials. So let's go over one large commonly seen attack, ransomware attacks. We heard so much about this in the panel today morning in the keynote, if you attended, right? Um, any ransomware attack begins with an email. Surprise, surprise. It starts with the attacker sending a malicious attachment or they send embedded links within the email that has a redirected malicious link. Users, giving the benefit of the doubt, they could click on it, they may not click on it, they can accidentally click on it. Once the malicious attachment downloads into the device, it starts its exploitation. At which point, a side note, if there is any softwares that are waiting for installation or software updates that are happening, those can also be infected by this malware and it could be converted into a defense mechanism. It can break into the malware defense mechanism and it can convert that as a um, malicious delivery through the software update. And that is called as the supply chain attack. Further, it goes and spreads across your network trying to check where else is the user having access to the data or access to other servers and it starts exploiting everything, encrypting the data that the user has and finally leading to an extortion for future uh, revenue generation as well. Considering how the threat landscape has evolved, even our security design has also meaningfully changed. We started off with the security model where we considered um, trust as an attribute where users are within the network or outside the network. You've heard this multiple times, the castle and moat uh, analogy. Uh, that has its own limitations and we have evolved into an early maturity model where it has continuous validation. And further, we realize that data by itself need to be protected with zero trust. So the data needs to be inventoried, protected against accidental or intentional data leakage. How do we create a cloud service with zero trust in mind, right? It has to be cloud native. You don't want the solution to be attached to your device. Uh, a truly browser-based architecture gives you the freedom of eliminating any such vulnerabilities and macros associated with it. It also gives the users the best user experience, if you think about it. It has the flexibility for the users not to carry their devices around, and it gives them the defense in depth making sure that every layer of the data path, it's completely protected end to end. And it is all stored in a data server that has full protection with no vendor in the middle attack. It's completely owned and operated by the cloud service provider. So this zero trust, when we implement zero trust, we use the model that's defined by CISA, uh, United States Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. According to their zero trust model, we make sure that it is real time protections. It's not sharing or allowing a user access and then revoking. It is real time AI based automated protections and it gives that best user experience. Think about it. You don't want the security to be overly restrictive. You need the user experience to be better for your users. 
and it has to be integrated with all the other legacy services and systems that you use. With all of these in mind, we have created an email solution that has an enterprise-grade security and built-in AI defenses. This provides solutions and security around preventing phishing, spam, and spoofing emails from even showing up in your user's inbox with over 99.9% .9 accuracy. In the upcoming slides, we'll be going over layer by layer on how we are able to achieve this. To make these AI defenses much more robust and strong, we consider three things. The reputation of the sender. So think about what are the IP heuristics whether this user, have they been sending quite a lot of spam messages? And do they actually have recipients who received the message and clicked on reporting report spam? So these reputation and clustering of the content to check what are the types of content the user sends, all of these put together trains our ML and AI model to build that reputation factor. And this gives us that AI defense to give you an enterprise-grade protection against all these attacks. So let's dive another layer deeper. So what happens? Any email that is getting sent to your mail exchange, it starts with DMARC, uh, domain-based authentication, reputation uh, conformance. So it makes sure that your email follows sender policy framework. It has the digital signature to affirm that they are indeed coming in from that domain. So nobody can imitate your CFO and send an email to you. That is done as DMARC comes in. And then there is a whole lot of deep scanning that is conducted during the pre-delivery phase. What does the deep scanning do? With advanced spam mail protection, it takes that email into a virtual sandbox and it detonates the attachment. It opens up the attachment to see whether it's malicious. Does it actually download anything? Is it causing anything to start into a worm type of mode? Or is it going to exploit your uh, source? Uh, so it checks all of that. And after detailed tests are conducted, then the email is being sent into your inboxes. At which point, users go through another layer of antivirus protection. And for your own domain policies, for example, you may have some data loss protection rules. If there is a project secret mission, if there is any secret keywords, you could apply labeling for it, or you could apply data loss prevention for it. Uh, so all of those policies are applied, and then it ensures that users are able to access your emails. The same level of scanning and protection is also applied for outgoing emails. This ensures that there is over 99.9% .9 protection against business email compromise. You heard this today morning in the keynote in a much more high level, and this is how it is executed from an email solution. There are quite a lot of case studies available if you look up in Google um, blogs, and here's one recently from a mayor, uh, city of Dearborn says, they have seen a significant reduction of emails since moving into Google Cloud. Let's go one level further, right? How do these happen? How do these email defenses actually work? Every email system has something called as content classification models. It checks for content and it confirms whether this is a phishing attack or a legitimate email and it allows the email to be delivered. How do bad actors act? they actually use text manipulation to swap out some of the words. So think about swapping neighborhood words or changing B to D or seven to nine. And all of these uh, confuse our content classifier models. And that's the act from bad actors and uh, state-sponsored adversaries. How do we stay ahead? We need to stay ahead, right? We see how these things happen. So in order to stay ahead for Gmail, we have created a multilingual text vectorizer called as RETVEC. And this is a resilient and efficient text vectorizer. This RETVEC 
It is a state of the art phishing detection that improves your detection by 38% while keeping the computational cost lower. We are a cloud service and we need to keep the computational power lower and we do that by using a lightweight word embedding model. So how does this lightweight word embedding model work? We'll go another layer down. Um, you all heard of the term LLMs. Large language models have been helpful to us, creating fancy emails, professional emails, easier creation of documentation, right? These LLMs are also used by bad actors. Surprise, surprise. Bad actors use these to create a really large scale personalized attack that is very challenging for content classification models and algorithms. So we have trained LLMs that are distilled LLMs, which are trained based on uh, high confidence spam samples, which does not only take the syntactic similarity of the email, but also the semantic intent behind it. I'm throwing in words, what does that mean, right? Imagine this is the email that is getting sent. It looks a little blurry, yeah? No way. But you can see that the first email says greetings and it has a bomb for don't disregard the action. You can clearly see this, this is the type of spam messages that we used to get. Now with LLM, few words are changed, emojis are introduced and it makes it much more relatable, believable. So even though it's an NFT lucrative offer, there is a high chance that someone who is into NFTs, they could click in it. So that's how LLMs are changing some things with a different semantic intent. And this email could also be uh, caught with our AI defenses that are also trained by LLMs. LLMs against LLMs? Yes, we are training LLMs to fight against LLMs. By doing this, we have improved 20% more spam detection, and that has also improved our productivity and protection by 1,000 times. So let's go back to the ransomware kill chain. How does this map all these email defenses? How does this map to this? We are strengthening our posture by using Google Workspace, which takes into fact all these pre-delivery scan which will prevent the email from even delivering into your inbox. And let's say hypothetically, if the email does get delivered, you will still have the protection of having all your data in Google Drive, which is not sitting in your local laptop device. So there is no harm done by the malware on your device. Let's say, for example, the file, the malware does get uh, installed or it is in your computer with a safe browsing mechanism in your browser and if you are using Chrome OS, the file partition of Chrome OS prevents any downloaded files from accessing OS-based common file formats or corrupting them by any chance. And this gives you that holistic protection from having ransomware attacks even occurring in your domain. Tying it all up together, a true productive and collaboration solution should have zero trust embedded within it that takes into fact everything across the user, right from when the user is logging in, how is their identity and provisioning working with multi-factor authorization using a security key. It has proven that we have seen very, very, very less probable attempts of phishing or stolen credentials. And with context-aware access, it adds another layer of contextual parameters like IP address, the device they log in from. So if someone is going on a vacation, you could block them from accessing the work data. So that is context-aware access, and it helps you with authorizations. And we also give you the benefit of having encryption at rest and in transit. And with client-side encryption, you can add another layer of encryption if you choose to have it. So cloud service provider will not have access to your data. And all of these tie together with giving your admins the benefit of a single pane of glass monitoring 
not just monitoring data, but also investigating and remediating the data using security center built within workspace. This enables your admins to have a lower admin overhead so that they will have everything available within admin console. We have government um, configurations and compliance regimes there for a reason, right? It gives you the assurance that it follows a standardized approach of how to secure your data. These are some of the uh, regimes and compliance uh, regulations that Google Workspace is now accredited. FedRAMP High, we have all our data centers uniformly accredited for FedRAMP High. And we also have the ability to store your CGIS data and we are ITAR compliant. And very recently, we are also CMMC compliant. So that gives you the full protection that your organization needs from the compliance requirements need. With that, let me bring in Adam Curry and Adam Eret, our technology strategists, to share their stories. All right, thank you for coming in. Okay. But my mic is sliding. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, welcome, Adam. I hope you are enjoying the MY session so far. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, certainly. Um, sure, so my name is Adam Merritt. I run all of our corporate technology at Equifax. So we have about 24,000 end users in 23 countries around the globe. And um, certainly as part of that is our collaboration stack, including Google Workspace. Thank you. What about you, Adam? Uh, Adam Curry, I am the CISO for HCL Software. Um, we are about an 8,500 uh, employee-wide global organization. Um, and also I've recently gone through a migration from O365 to GWS. Amazing, thank you. Um, so to begin with, can you share a little bit about your journey of how you chose your productivity and collaboration platform? Every IT organization has a list of decision-making process when they choose their software. How did you choose? Where are you with that? Sure, so I, I'll start with that. Um, so certainly for us, um, we went to Workspace at the time G Suite about five and a half years ago. Um, for us, I mean, we were, we at the time we had a on-prem older solution um, certainly didn't, didn't meet a number of needs we were looking for. And, and for us as an organization, we were preparing to go through a transformational shift to cloud off of on-prem. And as part of that, certainly on the employee side, on the end user side, we wanted to show full buy-in to that. So not only as part of that cloud shift did we want to go cloud, we wanted to promote a culture of ruthless collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure everyone was working off the same platform on the same documents as much as possible. So, you know, based on that and the direction we wanted to go as a company, um, Workspace was a, a very good fit for what we were looking for. A true collaboration solution, real-time collaboration, agreed. How about you, Adam? Um, so, <clears throat> from, from a software perspective, we have a very diverse and complex environment. Um, we develop software for, for on-prem and, and cloud-native um, uh, use cases. And one of the things that we were looking at as we were starting to really develop our zero trust model, we were looking at the collaboration tools and wanted to identify a mechanism or platform that would really enable that zero trust model the, to the most efficient uh, way possible. And GWS definitely fit that mold. Um, you know, again, it was something that one was very familiar with the majority of our employees already because of the Gmail uh, experience, um, but also because, and as you mentioned earlier today, that it really removed itself, it obfuscated itself from the local client, right? We went from having to manage, you know, four or five, six different Microsoft applications individually on the uh, endpoint to now managing really the Chrome browser through Chrome Enterprise. Um, being able to move a good portion of our users to Chromebooks, um, this really, again, enabled us to simplify our environment um, and really provide a true role-based and, and really security risk-based approach to how we 
govern our data, how we access our data, um, both from a collaborative perspective, from an official communication perspective. So those were really the big uh, justifications for why we went to GWS. Yeah, you bring up a great point. Uh, Google Workspace also includes mobile device management. So it is able to track all the endpoints, which gives a little bit of an edge on how to manage these endpoints. And just to add on that real quick, that, that endpoint management works well with our existing endpoint management as well too. So yeah. again, you have to manage the whole ecosystem, right? The whole environment, but where we can gain simplif simplification and take the telemetry that GWS provides us and feed it into our other monitoring, whether it's user behavioral analytics or a next generation SIEM or you know, even EDR, or whatever the case may be, um, it does add a pretty unique value statement. Agreed, yes, great story. Um, I spoke about quite a lot of threat landscape and how it has evolved. We've seen newer threats that are happening and how admins have to stay ahead. The pattern that I've seen in working with customers is they are thinking about what is our risk management? Um, what, what happens, what is the worst case scenario? And when there is uh, an adversary attack or when I'm having a data loss uh, at, in any fashion, what, how am I managing it? And for that, some of our customers and domains are using continuity of operations method to um, safeguard their data. So in that sense, how are you looking at maintaining resiliency? I mean, I can speak for us. So from our side, certainly one of the things from an end user perspective, uh, one of the things we're very focused on and actively working through now is to get all of that end user data into Google Drive. So we want everything off the local computer. Um, unfortunately, I'd, I wish we had more Chromebooks in our shop because it would make that much easier. Um, but we're, we're mainly a Windows and Mac shop. Um, so really, forcing, not forcing, but directing the users to yes. get that data off the local computer into Drive, particularly now with client-side encryption availability, which we do use quite heavily. Um, it really enables us to get off, get out of the data center, which is one of our main goals, but get that local data off that laptop while still meeting our, our um, data privacy requirements. So it's key for us. So it, we had a little bit of an easier time with that because we were previously on OneDrive. So the migration from OneDrive to Google Drive was was pretty straightforward for, for our company and our, our employees. Um, the experience was very similar. Um, but that being said, you know, the, the cyber resiliency, you know, and, and as we've seen with things, it, it doesn't have to be just a malicious attack, right? It could be a bad code deployment, yes. um, as we've seen recently. Um, so you know, understanding where your data is and how you have redundancy to that data is, is very important. And from a, you know, a BCP perspective, you know, trying not to rely on one entire technology, uh, I think is also important. Having a good out of band strategy um, and a backup strategy is important where it financially makes sense. Um, but that has to be weighed. Every company has different unique needs, requirements, and so you kind of have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. But for our company, um, you know, again, getting the majority of our data into GWS was a pretty straightforward task. However, um, a lot of the, the data replication policies and controls that we were able to apply within GWS were very helpful for us to, A, ensure that we're compliant with a lot of the regional uh, and governmental data privacy regulatory requirements that you have uh, and data sovereignty requirements, but at the same time, still have some level of redundancy there. So, yeah. and, and taking that on a data classification layer approach as opposed to just a holistic data location or storage. That's approach. right, yeah. With data classification, we also have automated data classification that's trained by our AI models. Mm -hmm. Um, so you don't have to create those manual configurations. You can have the AI models train and classify data automatically. Um, you also bring up a good point about compliance um, regimes. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I work with several government agencies and explaining how all our data centers are FedRAMP high. No, tell me, how do I actually get a FedRAMP high domain your domain is currently FedRAMP high. <laughs> That's our um, explanation. So I go through this on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
does any of the compliance requirements make sense or is it a, a requirement for you all? Which ones are important? So certainly for us, a, a number of them are important. We are looking at, uh, as a company, we're looking uh, at our own uh, FedRAMP compliance mm -hmm. uh, for um, different lines of business there. So workspace already being FedRAMP high was certainly a significant help for us in laying out what that landscape will look like and, and what the overall um, kind of uh, architecture looks like for, for the FedRAMP compliance that we're working towards. Maybe some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we have very similar uh, requirements as well. Um, uh, given a number of our customer bases, you know, our, our, work, our customer requirements become our requirements. That's right. And so having a broad range of customers in different verticals and industries um, dictates that we have a pretty robust set of, of regulatory requirements and be able to meet those. Um, and, you know, some of the, the requirements like the FedRAMP uh, high certification for GWS actually allowed us to move workflows that were typically ran in a very secured, isolated silo and methodology or whatever the case may be now to provide that into a cloud native solution that provides better usability and productivity for our customers. I mean, sorry, for our employees that, that work in these work streams. So, you know, now we're able to kind of take this merge of you know, typically security and productivity usually, you know, at odds ends, right? You the more secure you get, the less productive you are. The more productive you are, the less secure you are. However, GWS has actually helped us kind of bridge that gap where we could do both in, in some instances. So yeah, agreed. Thank you. Um, so from a technology standpoint, I was explaining about zero trust and how we make sure that it should not be overly restrictive and how you need to have a good balance about user experience. So how do you manage that? <laughs> you do have, you deal with a lot of PII data. Yes, so it, it's, it is a constant balance. I think Adam started to touch on it, right? It's a constant balance of the user experience to the level of rigor around security and regulation. And yes. finding that, that point, and, the, and there are ways to adjust it, but finding kind of that middle ground that, that, that creates that good balance is, I, you know, I really feel it's kind of a never ending cycle. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we'll step on, we'll, we'll go through one process and we think we've got it right, and then something new will come along and we'll, we'll start to go in a different, different direction. So certainly from a, you know, from a cloud focus standpoint, being on a complete cloud platform gives us a lot more flexibility there. Yeah. Um, you know, my kind of, as the advocate for our end users, one of my mantras is any device, anytime, anywhere. So yes. how do you do your job at your kid's soccer game like at four in the afternoon, right? So I wanna make sure I'm enabling my <laughs> users to be able to do that while at the same time balancing where they are in these kind of in the security environment and ensuring we have, you know, well-rounded controls around everything. Agreed, yeah. That's the work-life balance. And you having multiple offices across the world, how do you manage that? Yes, so that's, you know, one thing I will say that I found out that, you know, having had an IT or an IT career for a good portion of my career and then moving into the security realm, that contention between technology enablers and security is vital. It has to be a healthy contention, and sometimes it's not. But that having healthy contention is, I strongly believe, keeps you in that sweet spot of the appropriate levels of security controls as well as uh, user productivity. Now, there are hard requirements, right? We have regulatory body requirements. Um, our company has to deal with MIDI and CERTIN in India, a, a whole slew of different um, data privacy, uh, GDPR, CCPA, India has new data privacy as well. Um, and then, you know, you get into a lot of the different third-party attestations and certifications that you have to attest to. So you do have to, to some extent, there are some requirements that are static, for lack of a better term, but it, realistically, the way you enable and, and apply those controls, um, you have some level of cre creativity based on the technology that you apply and how you bring all that technology together. And, Again, being able to do that with the user productivity is, is it's again, kind of risk 101. What's the, what's the, the impact to the business yep. versus the security risk or the data loss risk or whatever the case is, and where's that happy medium? And so again, it's different for everybody. There is not a magic solution for everybody, but that working with the teams, the constant feedback from the employees is critical here. Um, and also educating them on understanding why we have to do some of these other things, right? So. As long as everybody comes together, you will find that that 
harmonized uh, zone, if you will, between the two. Agreed, yeah. So in closing out, what advice do you have for maintaining a security best practice for other agencies, for other organizations? Um, <laughs> so you have to take, again, all the data approach. You have to take a, a common sense, again, security approach. You can't do security for the sake of security. Um, however, you can't just be the wild, wild west and let things fly. <laughs> um, so you have to understand what your risk profile is for your company, where do your high risks sit, and then how do you go through and what tools uh, you can bring to your uh, advantage to help mitigate those, right? And again, it's, it's in a lot of cases, it's custom fit for each company. Um, one thing I will say, though, is you'll never rest on your laurels. Um, you can have all the best security tools and practices and controls in place. Doesn't mean that something will not happen at some point in time. So it's not just about being secure, it's about being ready. So Yeah, and I'll say, you know, one thing we've really focused on from a kind of just a threat landscape is around centralization of tooling. Because if you have four different chat tools, that's four different layers, you, four different areas you have to protect. If you centralize on single systems, whatever they are, but you centralize on those single systems, that significantly reduces those threat vectors. So that's, that's something we've been massively focused on, that and also on the zero trust side of things and making that a simple transition for our employees as well. Agreed, yeah. With Workspace having the power of coexistence, we've seen many, many customers using legacy services and exploring video for some other solution and chat and drive with Google. There is a mix of usage, mm -hmm. so it definitely resonates for most organizations. Um, so with that, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Um, it Thank was you. a pleasure hearing how you navigate all the security challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis and how you still maintain sanity in your organization. That's the key. Um, thank you for coming out here and sharing your thoughts. Um, I will open it up for any questions if you all have. Yeah, hang on one second. Let me come on up there so everyone can hear you. <laughs> Uh, back to your um, uh, email uh, uh, part of your presentation. As far as, you know, <clears throat> users be users, right? Mm -hmm. So you have users that will constantly mark stuff as spam or phishing that isn't. Even stuff that is like internal general communication. As far as your, your um, AI doing its training and its learning, how do you ensure that it does not accidentally mark legitimate mail as phishing and spam because of user activity? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm smiling because I have a teenager son and he does that for all his teacher's emails too. <laughs> um, but yes, that's where the reputation comes into matter. When I was talking about how AI defenses are designed, we not only take the AI reputation, the IP address, the sender, but we also look at the content and the semantic intent behind it. If that user or the sender, they have never sent such emails to others or they don't have the habit of sending mass emails, those would not hurt their reputation. Unless there are like hundreds of users that are clicking this as report spam, the reputation does not hurt. So that's how we have trained the spam detection models to take into factor the clustering of content and improving our spam detection based on that. And just by clicking report spam, it does not hurt the reputation. Thank you for asking. Next question. Okay. Are you sure? Hang on one second. I we, we are recording this for people who are missing the session, so. Definitely. Then I'll talk quieter. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That, I, I was really, it's, it's good to hear from folks. I think it sounds like both of you came in with really realistic expectations about what you wanted out of this transition. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear from both of your points of view, uh, what were some surprises along the way? You had realistic expectations around the technology, the change management, 
and the benefits that you were, at least some of the benefits that you were going to get out of this, but I'm curious what surprised you. So for me, having done this, done a large email migration five times now, um, the surprises are 98% of the time are with the users. It's, it's always a, it's typically a people problem. It's, it's rarely a technology issue. Um, we will have surprises around, you know, oh, we need, you know, this document format, or we have 2,000 users that need VB with Excel. Um, there, there could be, there, there's always something on the end user side. So I think a lot of it, and a lot of, and, and to kind of follow on to that, well, I think a lot of reducing surprise comes down to user change management. Right, so not the te technology, uh, it's, I consider kind of really the easy part. It's the, it's the user change management that having the right team involved, making sure you're collecting as much feedback as possible before this transition, because typically I, we do this in a big bang approach, so we migrated 20,000 users in, in one weekend. Right, so you wanna be as prepared as possible up to that time. Um, but really focusing on what the key end user use cases are and understanding what the outliers are. Are, were, are key areas that will help find those issues before they happen. Because there's always gonna be something, but it's almost always on the end user side. I don't know if you have anything. I, so we, we did a migration a little bit more spread out than that. We did it in three phases, so not quite the big bang. I, we had the same challenges that, that you had, um, and we identified those pretty quickly, where from a Microsoft perspective, right, you have very complex Excel documents, which, honestly is kind of a, 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 a more traditional way of working, right? Um, we actually spun up a team, a support team, to, to combat this, and we had to be very reactive with this. We weren't anticipating it through our research, through our, you know, working with the, the users. We, did, we knew it was gonna be a problem, we didn't know how big of a problem it was gonna be. Um, and so we actually very rapidly spun up a team to help support migrating these complex uh, Excels into actual database and leveraging analytic reporting you know, uh, from, from Google um, and from other tools as well um, to, to really start building that, that process out. So doing data lakes and, and things like data fabrics and things like that and really kind of going down that path. Um, it, it didn't eliminate all the use cases, but it did get probably 90% of them. The other challenge that we had is, and I've done a number of email migrations in the past where either I've mo moved platforms or I've switched domains but I've never done both at the same time. I would recommend not doing that. That's probably not a good idea. It was a little painful for us, um, just building that reputational for a brand new domain. And we also decided to use a dot .software domain, which is kind of a new, I don't want to call it a vanity URL, but it was a new domain that in itself doesn't have a high reputation. So um, those were probably the biggest like, oops, we kind of tripped over ourselves there and got a little, little greedy. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, my recommendation, if you were going to do something to that effect, do it in phases. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's a vanity you are. I'm coming. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions. And uh, the first is, um, is it just me or are you wearing the same outfit? We went to what's where to work .com this morning, made sure we lined up. And we figured since we're both Adams, we should just look alike. Yeah. There you go. But um, all, all jokes aside, my question really is, can you speak to your, your, your user's experience and your administrative experience moving from multiple agents or applications um, on a on our host, particularly to GWS? Multiple so, agents into one host as GWS. Okay, so you're talking about moving from like an on-prem right, system right. To, to cloud, sure, sure. So yeah, so going through that migration, so as I said, we have about 24,000 end users. So to support those end users specific to Google Workspace, uh, and this is not including the security stack, but specific to Google Workspace, we have a team, a wonderful team, of about, uh, it's, a, it's a team of about 12 that support that. That's significantly reduced from the kind of landscape of our older system, which was an exchange, on-prem exchange system that was very regional in nature. So our, our system is now a completely global, it's, everyone is on Workspace, there are no ifs, ands, or buts, there are no exceptions. So our entire company is on Workspace, so we are not running you know, a multiple hybrid systems or 
you know, systems in some sort of colo fashion or in our own data centers. So it significantly reduced not only the data center overhead required just for hands-on maintenance, et cetera, uh, but in the, the complexities around managing multiple different systems with different technology types. Um, that, that's kind of my two cents on okay. it. Um, was your question more for the actual migration or just the, the user experience itself? So, so the migration from an email perspective actually went off pretty, pretty well without a hitch. We were able to move. I think that the users, the fundamental way of how SharePoint works on the back end versus Google Drive and the fact that, and I, if I say this wrong, I apologize, um, but you know, SharePoint uses a nested file structure where Google has labels, right? So it's kind of a flat file structure where we're using labels. That was a bit of a change, uh, the you know, educational thing that our users had to get used to. Um, I, but I think that that and not having the actual client was probably the biggest pain points for them. The data migration itself actually for, for email and for Drive was really straightforward, very easy to, to accomplish. SharePoint, however, became a bit trickier because again, the way you do the permissioning, the way you do the structures is different in the two different platforms. So trying to map that and move that over took a little bit more work uh, to, to get that done successfully. So um, the, the little bit of trial and error. <laughs> um, so, but, but those were the, like, kind of the biggest pieces of it. But I, from both from a migration and a user experience perspective, I think those were the biggest things that call out to me. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that as well. Definitely moving from a thick client like an Outlook to a completely web-based system uh, was probably the largest hurdle from just a, a, a interface style for the end users, definitely. It, especially just to kind of run back and forth here a little bit. Chrome obviously works much better within this environment than, I mean, Safari and others will work as well, but you have employees that have their preference, you know, whether it's Firefox or uh, I forget what Windows calls their stuff, Bing or whatever. Edge. It is. Edge, sorry, uh, which I believe is a Chromium backend, but um, they like their Pacific browsers. And we, you know, part of this was we mandated Chrome as our enterprise browser because you get a lot of additional controls and, and protections with that. So there's a little pushback from that too, because you know customers do like to use, or employees do like to use their preferred browsers. They still have them, they still can use them for other apps, but for productivity and whatnot, they have to use Chrome. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Yeah, right here. So my question directed to Rancho, uh, we are seeing an increased usage of legitimate services like OneDrive, SharePoint, and phishing attacks. And it's a challenge for us because, you know, uh, we are using these services apparently. So how AI slash ML can be used to uh, detect this kind of attacks? So you are using OneDrive and SharePoint for data storage. And you can actually migrate that into Google Drive and SharePoint could have multiple uses. So depending on whether you have workflow management in SharePoint, we could migrate that in Workspace. The AI defenses help with scanning your drive so that data that is uploaded into Google Drive from a local computer, it goes through again multiple deep scanning to prevent any accidental spam or malware getting uploaded into Google Drive because even if it gets uploaded, the built-in defenses in the server and the infrastructure, it prevents any executables to be running on those servers. So that's where the AI defenses, similar to email, it also goes through in Drive as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it.